John chapter 14, we'll be looking at verses 7 through 14 this morning. It's pretty common for sons to resemble their fathers, to be like their fathers. Uh, I have asked the question before with, with my son, David, who's seven. Why is he so wild? And, and, and one time when I asked that question, someone responded to me, were you when you were a kid? And I kind of thought about it for a second. I looked at them and said, yes. And they said, retribution. <laughs> Sons are like their fathers. Uh, King David was probably 45 to 50 years old when, when Solomon was born. And David passed away when Solomon was between 20 and 25 years old. And so Solomon reigned for 40 years up until age 60 over the nation of Israel without his dad. Now, David and Solomon were very similar in many ways. In fact, when you look back at Israel's history and you, you minus out King Saul, Solomon and David were, were kind of good kings in, in many ways. And I'm sure over those 40 years that Solomon reigned when David was passed away, the people said to, to Solomon things like, you are just like your dad. Or, or perhaps even negatively, if they didn't like him, he is just like his dad. Or they might, just, they might say, you look exactly like your father does. Because Solomon had many of the same characteristics as David. Now, he also had some bad characteristics that David had. He, fo he followed in the same footsteps of his father, both David and Solomon had many wives and concubines, and Solomon even took that further with many more than David had. But both David and Solomon also had a wandering eye, and Solomon evidenced that in his harem. So did David. The whole reason that Solomon was born was because of Bathsheba and David's wandering eye. But as Solomon, again, followed in the same footsteps of his father, we saw that Solomon's wives toward the end of his life, turned his heart away from God. But listen, Solomon was only representative of his dad in a very small way. Like, I represent my father. And those of you who, who know me and my father, you might say something to me like, wow, you guys are very similar. Sometimes my sisters joke and quip with me that I have the same idiosyncrasies as my dad when I'm preaching, and they, and they smile because they'll see some of the same characteristics. But my dad and I are separate beings. Solomon and David were, were separate beings. Solomon could reveal his father in some ways. In some ways, you could see David in Solomon. But listen, if you want to know King David, you have to meet him. If you want to know my dad... You can't come to me. You have to go to my dad. We are not one in the same. And today, Philip, in John 14, wants to know Jesus' dad. He wants to catch a glimpse of Jesus' dad. But why? Why does Philip want this? Because Jesus has announced that he's going away. He's leaving. And that causes great fear in the hearts of the disciples. All these three years we've been following you, and we're sitting here in this upper room, knowing, as Thomas said before they came to Bethany to heal Lazarus just a few weeks prior, that we're going to our death sentence. And now instead of leading us gloriously into battle, you're going to leave and leave us 11 people here to die at the hands of the Jews. And so there's fear in their hearts, and Jesus is trying to calm their fear. And so Thomas, he had asked in our last sermon, well, well, can you tell us the way to the place that you're going? Jesus said, I'm going to the Father's house. Thomas says, well, show us the way. Jesus said, it's through me. I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no man comes to the Father but by me. No man comes to the Father but by me. What does Jesus mean when he says he's the only way to the Father? That's the question that we'll answer this morning. This sermon, friends, is meant to exalt Christ. That's what John, the son of Zebedee, the writer of this gospel, is doing in this text this morning, exalting Christ. And I want you to know something, that I may be a little bit more exercised about this text this morning, because this doctrine is vital to our Christian faith. 
you hear the word fundamental doctrines of Scripture, or you might call them first-order doctrines of Scripture, and then you hear about secondary or second-order doctrines, and then you get all the way down to maybe tenth order when you're looking at who were the sons of God and daughters of men in Genesis 6. Were they angels or were they humans? And we can argue about that at that ad infinitum, but it doesn't change the fundamental basis of our faith. This does. This is a vital doctrine. And to deny the doctrine that John teaches in Scripture this morning is to deny the person of Jesus, and thus you are preaching a different Jesus altogether. The world wants a different Jesus. They desperately want a different Jesus, one that is made in their own image. The world hates this doctrine. Just about every religion in the world hates this doctrine. And so today, friends, we'll be convinced of the deity of Jesus Christ. The deity of Jesus Christ. And we'll find out why the world hates this truth. But for you this morning, what I'd like you to walk away with is to be convinced and comforted that Jesus is God. Be convinced and comforted. The title of the sermon this morning is, Get a Grip, I'm God. Would you look with me, please, at verse 7 of John chapter 14. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Jesus begins with a conditional statement, a condition like an if-then. If you'll do this, then I'll do that. If you had known me, then you would have known my Father also. Now remember, Jesus is still responding to a question. He's responding to Thomas' question. Can you show us the way? Show us the way to the Father. Thomas, man, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. And then he continues, if you had known me, you would have known my Father also. We might call this a gentle scolding to Thomas, a gentle scolding. Now, He's saying this phrase as if Thomas should have already known. Should Thomas have already known? Well, if we think back to John chapter 8 and verse 19, we read, You know neither me nor my father. If you knew me, you would know my father also. Now, he was saying that to the Pharisees, to the wicked Pharisees. Here he's talking to the righteous. There he was talking to the wicked, but the disciples were with him. They already heard him say that back in John chapter 8. If you knew me, you'd know my father also. And so Jesus is here in John 14, 7, expecting that the disciples already know this truth. And so it's a gentle scolding. If you had known me, you would know my father also. I am the way to the father. Now I say it's a gentle scolding because we know the disciples believed in Christ in the revelation that they did receive of him, they believed in him. They claimed that he was the Holy One of God. They claimed that he was teacher and Lord. In John 6, 69, we read, And we have believed and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. And so they believed that he was the Messiah. In John chapter 13 and verse 13, we read, You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for so I am. And so they had a partial recognition of who Jesus was. A partial recognition. Like they mostly understood who Jesus was, but not fully. I don't think Jesus is saying that they're unbelievers here because of the next phrase there in verse 7, from now on. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. And so Jesus does something for the disciples here that he didn't do for the Pharisees in John 8. In John 8, he blinded their eyes, deafened their ears, and he wouldn't allow them to see who he was. Not so with the disciples he says the same thing to the disciples that he did the Pharisees. If you had known me, you would have known my father also. But then he follows it up with, and from now on, you have known him and seen him. Now they will understand fully. Because it is Jesus who can make the Father known. John 1, 18, no one has ever seen God, the only God who is at the Father's side. He has made him known. From now on, you have seen him. You know, really, the disciples are going to know in, in about three days. 
In about three days from this time period, Jesus is going to rise from the dead. And then you fast forward 50 days from that and you arrive at Pentecost and the Holy Spirit comes upon them. And now it's a look back, not a look forward to a shadow. Now it's a look back to an event where Jesus had died. He had died before 6 p.m. because they didn't have to break his legs. They had taken him down from the cross and Joseph of Arimathea had buried him in a rich man's tomb as the prophecy had said. The guard had been placed around the tomb. An earthquake came, the guards fell over, an angel rolled the stone away and came and sat upon the stone. John comes to the tomb the next morning and sees the face cloth lying there folded up next to the grave clothes. And he remembers what Jesus had said and believes. From now on, you do know him. And have seen him. What a glorious promise. What a comfort to their troubled hearts because this is what Jesus is still doing, comforting their troubled hearts. Quick Greek lesson. If you read there, from now on, you know him and have seen him, have seen him. Now that's past tense, right? Like it's already happened. You have seen. In fact, it is past tense, but it's called a perfect past tense. Meaning it happened in the past, but it has continuing results. Like if I said to one of you, you have seen me, that means you already saw me at a point in time and are still seeing me. I have, you have seen him. But now comes the big rebuttal. Philip's going to step into the scene and he doesn't take this phrase as past tense. He thinks Jesus misspoke. He thinks seeing the Father is coming in the future. No, right now. Verse 8. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father, and it is enough for us. Now, we have to give Thomas and Peter and Philip some leeway here. They were scared. I think rightfully so in some ways. But here they have Jesus. Jesus. Can you imagine having Jesus with you? Here they have Jesus. But he's not enough for them. He's not enough to calm their troubled hearts. You know what is? The Father. If we could see the Father, that would be enough for us to proceed with courage. You could leave then. We've seen him. Ah, we know he's there. We know what he looks like. Now, now, Jesus, you can you can leave. Just a glimpse of the Father. Friends, what do you think? They think of Jesus. Here you have Jesus with you. And you're like, yeah, 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 you're the way, but just show us the Father. That's what we want to see. Jesus is chopped liver. He's second class. They cannot proceed with courage by listening to Jesus, by seeing Jesus. They need the Father. That's what they think of Jesus. It's like, you're great, but we want the Father. Philip knows Jesus is special. Remember, they called him the Holy One of God. They called him Lord and Teacher. But Jesus doesn't give Philip the confidence that he needs. And so Philip is missing something big about Jesus. Now, it's, it's kind of normal for Philip to ask this. You remember Moses? Moses is up on the mountain receiving the law, and and there he is, and and he he has one little request for God. Could you show me your glory? I just want to see you. And God hides his face behind a rock and lets him see the backside of his glory, and his face still glows when he comes down the mountain because you cannot look upon God. The vision of Isaiah where he sees the Lord high and lifted up. And so scant times throughout the Old Testament, we do see that men have seen the glory of God. And so what Philip wanted wasn't out of the ordinary. Isn't that what people want today? I'll believe if I can see God. I'll believe if if God appears to me, if he shows himself to me, then I'll believe your religion. But Philip thinks that he 
that they all need that. He says it is enough for us there in verse 8. But Philip totally missed the perfect past tense of Jesus' words. Verse 9, Jesus said to him, Have I been with you so long and you still do not know me, Philip? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? I don't know, sometimes it's difficult to read these verses and know exactly what tone of voice Jesus had. But this is the second scolding. Verse 7 was the first scolding. This is the second one. The first one was, if you had known me. The second is, you've been with me for three years and you don't know this? Get a grip, Philip. Calm down. Try to grasp what I'm saying. But why is Jesus saying this with, with some sarcasm here? With some pointedness here? I mean, shouldn't he be just long-suffering and, and bring them along? Like, they don't know this. They're confused. No, Jesus believes that Philip should have known. Why? John 12, 45. And whoever sees me sees him who sent me. Oh, so Jesus already said it. Whoever sees me sees him who sent me. The disciples should have known. Folks, this is where verse 9, verse 9 of, of John 14 is where this earthly father-son comparison breaks down completely. Because if you've seen Solomon, guess what? You haven't seen David. If you've seen me, you haven't seen my dad. I mean, you might say, that person's just a spitting image of their father, though. You know, Solomon, he, he had so many of the same characteristics, resemblance, sinful failures. It's like I've already seen David, but guess what? You haven't seen David if you've seen Solomon. Not so with Jesus. Not so with Jesus. They should have known. In John chapter 10 and verse 30, Jesus said, I and the Father are one. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Friends, this is the first order doctrine. This is fundamental to who Jesus is. Jesus is God. We read in Colossians 1 and verse 15, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. We read in Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 3, He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of His nature. We read in Colossians 2, 9, For in Him, that is in Christ, the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily. Jesus is not a God. He is not merely fully representing God. Friends, Jesus is the exact revelation of the Father in human flesh. So what's his point in verse 9? What's Jesus' point? Philip. Philip, Philip, Philip. You want to catch a glimpse of the Father, do you? I'm the object of your faith. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. I am the object of your faith. Jesus. Just like he told Thomas, I am the way and the truth and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. Now, now remember, Philip's a little confused because he says, I'm the way to the Father. So how is Philip thinking about that? He's thinking about it in human terms. So Philip thinks he knows. Oh, then show me the Father. When Philip hears, I'm the way to the Father, he's not thinking, oh, I'm actually looking at him when I look into Jesus' face. He's thinking, oh, Jesus could take me there. Jesus knows how to get there. So he'll take me to the Father. Or maybe he's thinking, oh, Jesus, so Jesus can pull back the curtain and, and, and give me a glimpse of the Father? This is how Philip's thinking about it. There is no curtain. There is no curtain. There is no point on a map to where Jesus can take one of us and show us the Father. When Jesus speaks, friends, the Father is speaking. 
When Jesus acts, the Father is acting. When you look at Jesus, you're looking at the Father. Jesus is the way to the Father in that when you have placed your faith in Jesus, you have literally placed your faith in the Father. They are one and the same God. You are looking at God in the flesh. You say, well, how does, this, uh, how does this doctrine help me? How does this first order doctrine help me? Because I already believe this. Like, I believed it when I came in today. Appreciate the fact that you're sharing it. But, but, uh, but how does this help me? This is the let not your hearts be troubled that Jesus said in verse 1 of this chapter. This is the let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. Jesus is not God's representative prophet. Jesus says, my promises are God's promises. Show us the Father. You're looking at him, buddy. But Jesus keeps scolding them here for a moment because he wants them to get this. Verse 10. Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does his works. Do you not believe? Remember last time we looked at the remedy for worry and anxiety and panic? As Jesus said, let not your hearts be troubled. What was the remedy? What was the remedy for worry and anxiety and panic? Belief. Belief. Because, friends, it is not that Jesus hasn't said it. Meaning, it's not for lack of information. It is not for misunderstanding in that Jesus hasn't clearly said it. It's that they didn't believe it. And so this question is a third scolding. Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? But then in the same verse, he goes on to a fourth scolding. I've already backed it up with works. And those works prove that the Father and I are one in John ch chapter 10 and verse 38, but if I do them, even though you do not believe me, believe the works that you may know and understand that the Father is in me and I am in the Father. Over and over and over again in this gospel, he has already taught his disciples this truth. And so he's scolding them. He's saying, how can you be with me so long? If you had known me, you would know the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Don't you believe that I'm in the Father and the Father is in me? And why should they believe this? Why should they believe this man from Nazareth and his words? Because in the Son, we see the Father's works. Vital belief. Verse 11. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me, or else believe on account of the works themselves. You don't believe my words? You don't want to listen to me? Okay. Believe the works. John chapter 5 and verse 36, but the testimony that I have is greater than that of John. For the works that the Father has given me to accomplish, the very works that I am doing bear witness about me that the Father has sent me. Notice in verse 11 there, he says, believe me. He doesn't say believe in me. Not that we are not supposed to believe in Jesus. We absolutely are, but that's not the point he's making. He's saying, believe me, meaning believe what I'm telling you. Believe my words, the words that I'm saying. Believe them. What does this tell us? Friends, it tells us that what Jesus says is true. The words that Jesus speaks are true. Believe me. This whole passage is all about belief. It's not about misunderstanding. Jesus had already said it. The question is, do you believe what he says? Do you? I know I don't know your hearts. I can't look into them. 
Do you believe that Jesus is God in the flesh? The claim, unlike nearly every other religion. Friends, Jesus came to earth as God so that he, as the eternal, sinless God, could pay the sin debt of every man, woman, and child. And if you would believe in him, there will be a transaction that takes place. If you have not believed in him, that transaction could take place right now, this morning, where you're seated in silence between you and God. And the transaction that could take place, much like a banking transaction, is called imputation. Imputation. And that is where the righteousness of Jesus will be credited to your account. And your unrighteousness is debited out of your account. And it goes on to Christ. It's a swap. It's something that no sinful human being could do for you. Because any other human being who has sin deserves to die for their own and could never die for yours. And so, friends, Jesus stands ready to forgive you if you would believe that Jesus died for your sins and rose from the dead. Believe in him as your Lord today. You would be saved. I pray that you would. And so the disciples believed that Jesus was a prophet. They believed that he was Messiah. They believed that he was the Holy One and Teacher and Lord. But here in John 14, Jesus wants his disciples to be convinced that he is God in the flesh. But up until now, up, in, up until verse 11, all of his works have been in the past tense. Believe the works, meaning the works that I already did in the past tense. Now in verse 12, he's going to switch gears to future works that will prove he's God. Verse 12. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do, and greater works than these will he do, because I am going to the Father. So it kind of seems like he switched gears, like he's talking about something different now. And he is, but there's a thread that runs through this that we see throughout the entirety of John 14 up until this verse. What is that thread? Whoever believes in me. Same thread. It's all about belief in Christ. It's what he said in verse 1, and it's what he's saying right here in verse 12. First it was... I've done past works, past proofs to my deity. Now it's, you're going to do future works through me that are going to prove my deity. If you believe in me, I'll prove it to you. You'll do greater works than mine. Then you'll know that Jesus is who he said he is. What does Jesus mean here that the disciples are going to do greater works than Jesus? Well, he's not talking about greater in number. There's actually a different Greek word for that if we wanted to express more works counting them. How many did Jesus do? How many of the apostles going to do? They'll do greater works. It's not talking about in number. He's talking about in quality. Greater in quality. In John chapter 1 and verse 50, we see this idea of greater in quality. Greater in quality. Jesus answered him, because I said to you, I saw you under the fig tree. Do you believe? You will see greater things than these. Not greater in number, but greater in quality. And so is Jesus trying to tell the disciples here in, in verse 12 that you're going to do more stupendous, more sensational, and more spectacular miracles than I've done? Is that what he's getting across to them? I mean, they've got a high bar to live up to. Jesus fed 5,000, likely probably 25,000 because it was 5,000 men with five loaves and two fish. Jesus calmed storms with a word. Peace, be still. And the storm stopped. Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead after he had been dead four days. And so is Jesus trying to tell these people, You're, you'll do greater works, more spectacular works than I? Maybe, probably not. I mean... You say, well, they do get cloven tongues of fire resting over their heads, and they're speaking in like 30 to 50 different languages at one time at Pentecost. That's pretty spectacular. I agree, that's pretty spectacular. 
And you say, and Peter raised Dorcas from the dead. And Paul raised Eutychus from the dead when he fell out of the window. I mean, I agree that when you look through the book of Acts, you see works that are seemingly on par with what Christ did. But is he trying to teach that, that the disciples are going to do greater works? Meaning more sensational. Or will they be greater in extent? Will they be greater in, as one writer put it, magnitude? There's one part of verse 12 we, we, we missed, we didn't talk about. It's right at the end of verse 12. At the end of verse 12, we receive the cause for the greater works. Look at that. Because I am going to the Father. Greater works than these will he do because I am going to the Father. Why will the works be greater because Jesus is leaving? Why is that the cause for the greater works? Well, when we get to chapter 16, we'll still be in the upper room discourse, and, and you'll find out that Jesus says, I have to leave in order for something to happen. I have to leave in order for the Holy Spirit to come. The Holy Spirit can't come until I leave. And here in verse 12, he says, In greater works than these will he do because I am going to the Father. When the Holy Spirit comes, what happens? What happens on Pentecost when Peter gets up and preaches this amazing sermon? 3,000 people get saved in one shot. And the Jerusalem church has begun. And then you look throughout the book of Acts and you watch as the apostles go into all the world and they prove their, their message by doing signs and wonders. As we read in 2 Corinthians 12, 12, the signs of a true apostle were performed among you with utmost patience, with signs and wonders and mighty works. And you watch as the church global begins to form. As Gentiles believe and are baptized, as Samaritans believe and are baptized, and as now they are looking back at the death and resurrection of Jesus, and no more does Jesus have to say, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Now the apostles are saying it because they have seen it with their eyes as Jesus appeared to 500 eyewitnesses after his resurrection. Jesus only went to Israel, to the, to the lost sheep of Israel. But the apostles go into the world. Furthermore, the works of the apostles can be done all simultaneously as the Holy Spirit can indwell all of them at once. And so Jesus is promising that when I leave, when I leave, you're going to do future works after the Holy Spirit comes upon you and they're going to be greater in extent or greater in magnitude than the works that I have done. And again, the thread that runs through this is believe that when you're looking at me, you've seen the Father. And I'll prove it to you. You're going to do greater works than me. And when they do, they'll go, oh yeah, I see what he was saying. But Jesus goes on to explain how they will do these mighty works. Verse 13. Whatever you ask in my name, this, will, uh, this I will do that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. Now, we'll stop here for a moment. We'll understand that this promise seems quite unequivocal. We understand that the way to do these works is through prayer. Whatever you ask in my name. And we look in the book of Acts throughout it. We look at Paul and his missionary journeys. We look at Peter. And then you even look into 1 Corinthians and you see these works that Jesus was talking about on display. Really clear to see. To prove that the message is from God. To prove that the message is from God. The works that Jesus is promising here prove that their message is from God. Same with Jesus, right? Don't believe me. Believe the works. When you see the works, you know that they came from the Father. But friends, once it is proven and written down, we don't need the works anymore. In other, in other words, the purpose for the works, the purpose for the science is complete. Now, some of you may not have been here in, in June when my good friend, Pastor Jonathan Michelet, came and, and did a three-part series on sign gifts and, and, and prophets and apostles and the fact that these offices and, and these signs have ceased. 
If you'd like to go and hear that, you can go and look that up on our Facebook page, on our, on our, on our YouTube page. You can listen to those. But once the message has been proven, and once it's been written down in God's Word, we don't need these signs anymore. Jesus and the apostles were clear that those signs were for a very specific purpose. Furthermore, even though verses 13 and 14 seem unequivocal, it doesn't mean Jesus is going to give the disciples anything they ask for. You say, whoa, 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 whoa. Sure sounds like it. And people today still teach that he, he will. You just have enough faith. And I've met some of those people who have deserted the faith because it didn't happen to them. Signs are for proving a message. We see that we're supposed to ask in Jesus' name. What does in Jesus' name mean? Many of you say that after your prayers. I say that at the end of the prayers that I speak to God. Verse 13 and verse 14 say to pray in Jesus' name. Is this a magic formula? If we say in Jesus' name at the end of a prayer, then boom, he gives us what we want. It sure seems like what the verse is trying to say. No. It's not a magic formula. To ask in Jesus' name is to recognize that Jesus is the representative of the Father. Just like he's been saying. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. To ask in Jesus' name is to recognize that the request is granted on the merits of Christ. He's the one doing it. He did the past works, and he's going to do the future works. And that proves that he's from the Father. To say in Jesus' name recognizes that it's only granted, the request is only granted if it glorifies the Father through the Son accomplishing that work. And so we ask according to God's will. Just as John, the writer of this gospel, when he wrote his epistle, 1 John in verse 14 of chapter 5 of his epistle, and this is the confidence that we have toward him that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. You say, I still think it's unequivocal. I think that anything you ask, okay, even the apostles didn't get everything they asked for. You don't think Paul prayed about Demas? Lord, don't let him forsake you in Jesus' name. Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present world. What about Paul in prison? You don't think he prayed? Lord, in Jesus' name, open these prison doors and allow me to come out. He was in prison for quite a while. Wrote a few letters in prison, actually. What about Paul's thorn in the flesh? I besought the Lord three times that it might depart from me. In Jesus' name. And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. And Paul said, oh, Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmity that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Not you said, unequivocally, that if I ask in Jesus' name, you'll give me anything I ask for. What about Paul when he had to escape in a basket? Down a back window, through an alleyway, out the city so he wouldn't die. I don't think he asked in Jesus' name. What about when he was near Malta on that ship? And they were in a violent storm. You don't think he knelt and prayed, Lord, save us from this storm? In Jesus' name. I don't know. All those guys were on their deathbed at one point. But they're all dead. You don't think that they prayed that the Lord would deliver them? Why didn't those things happen? Be because they didn't pray? Because they didn't have enough faith? Or because that isn't what Jesus means here? Friends, in the garden, Jesus modeled it for us. He prayed in Luke twenty-two forty-two, 42, saying, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Did, Jesus, did God the Father remove the cup? No. Nope. He didn't get what he asked for. Jesus taught us to pray this way too. In the Lord's Prayer, Jesus said, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And so then what's the point of verses 12 through 14? Because it sure seems like he switched gears. He didn't. The point is, Jesus does the works. 
Jesus does the works. Believe him. He proved in the past. He proved in the future. He wrote it down. We're reading it this morning. Jesus does the works. It's all about Jesus' identity. Friends, who promises that the works will be done? Jesus does. Who accomplishes the works? Jesus does. And when the disciples go out into all the world and preach the good news, making disciples, they get it. Now, we see it's ultimately about the Father, but only insofar as the Son does more and more and more works. If people believe in the Son, then they will see that the object of their faith is true because they'll do works. That's what it's teaching. And so in John 14, we have this passage about longing for God, but missing Jesus. Longing for a glimpse of the Father, for the way to heaven, but missing the identity of Jesus Christ. Friends, this passage is the oneness of the Godhead. The wonderful doctrine of the Trinity. One God in three persons. Each person Equal in essence, nature, power, holiness, righteousness, and glory. Separate and distinct in their roles. Why does Jesus scold the disciples here? Why does he harp on this? Because, friends, it's a doctrine that's twisted and denied and lied about, and it's vital, it is fundamental. But why? Why is this doctrine so fundamental? Well, because the Bible says it, for starters. The Bible is our only authority of we've been learning on Wednesday evenings. But it's more than that. Why would the world and nearly every other religion be so intent on destroying this doctrine? Why this one? Why is this the one that if you go straight here with any other religion, they want to go everywhere else but here? I'll tell you why. Because if it's not true, if Jesus is not God, then your hearts better be troubled. Jesus isn't sinless. He's just a man, if this doctrine isn't true. If this doctrine isn't true, then Philip's request to see the Father was never fulfilled. He only saw a representation of the Father. If this doctrine is not true, Jesus cannot atone for the sins of the world. If this doctrine isn't true, then we stand condemned before a holy God who must pour out his wrath on us. If this doctrine isn't true, Jesus could not pay the eternal sin debt for you and for me. And friends, if this doctrine isn't true, there is no other way to the Father. There's no other way. Now, he told the disciples that they were going to do greater works. And when they did those works, they would believe in him. Did it happen? Did it happen? Did the disciples finally get this doctrine? Did Thomas get it? Did Philip get it? Well, do you remember after the resurrection in John chapter 20 and verse 28 when the disciples are hiding out in the upper room? About three and a half days after John 14 here. And Jesus walks through the walls into the upper room through closed and locked doors. Just after Thomas said, no, 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 he didn't rise from the dead. I will only believe if I see the nail prints in his hands and his side. And Jesus walks in the room and said, Oh, Thomas, blessed are those who believe without seeing. Here you go. What does Thomas say? Does he get this doctrine? He says, My Lord and my God. You're looking at him. And so I leave you with this. If this doctrine is true, and it is, by the way, 
then the disciples need not fear. The disciples need not catch a glimpse of the Father. For all of their hopes and all of their dreams and all of their security in the life to come and all of their salvation and all of their forgiveness rests in the God-man. And it does. Jesus is God. Jesus is our hope. Would you be convinced and comforted by that truth this morning? Your faith rests in the person of Jesus of Nazareth. When you look at him, you are looking at the Father. When you listen to him, you are listening to the Father and you can trust everything he says to you. You can trust the living God, Jesus Christ, to finally bring you home. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you for this great comfort. Because though often we look at these doctrines as mere theology classes, they mean something. We thank you that you devised the plan in eternity past that no human being could ever devise nor would ever want to devise. To send your only Son, holy, righteous, and beloved, sharing glory with you in eternity past, to this abysmal, debauched earth to die for your enemies. God, we pray that as a church we would stand convinced of this vital doctrine but also that as we leave this place this morning, that we would be so comforted and that our worry and our trouble and our panic hearts as we face the cares of this world would be at peace because we can place all of our hope and faith in Jesus, who is God in the flesh. We pray in Christ's name. Amen.